In the discourse on good omens, Mangala Sutta, the Buddha teaches us to associate with sages and not with fools. The first and foremost fool here is our own heart. In other words, there are fools outside and fools inside, and for the most part, the fools inside are the ones who keep stirring up trouble all the time. When we live with meditation masters, which is called associating with sages, we keep gaining lessons from sages, because that's what they are. They are wise in the various tactics they teach us. They have practiced and gained knowledge of everything from experience. Their teachings are thus correct, precise, and convincing to those who listen to them, with no room for any doubt. In particular, Venerable Atari Aman, there never was a time when he would teach saying, it seems to be like this, it seems to be like that. There was nothing but, this is the way it is for sure, for sure. And we were sure, because he spoke only the absolute truth taken right from a heart that had already known and seen, and from his own well-conducted practice. Especially in the case of illness, if there were any weak-willed cases, he would tell them, whoever is weak... Whoever cries and moans can take his moans as his medicine. There's no need to search out medicine anywhere, no need to have anyone to look after him. His moans are his medicine. If moaning serves any purpose, then why search for medicine to treat the disease? Then he would add, Keep moaning. Everyone can moan, even children can moan if it serves a purpose. But here it doesn't serve any purpose at all other than to annoy those good people who are unflinching in the practice. So you shouldn't moan out of weakness. You're a meditation monk. When you act like this, who can bear to see it? If you were a child or an ordinary person, there wouldn't be anything wrong with it because they haven't received any training. They don't have any knowledge or understanding of the various ways to contend with the pain, such as contemplating it. But you, you already know everything of every sort, yet when trouble comes, such as illness, you can't find any methods or tactics to care for yourself. You just go all to pieces. This won't do at all. You're ashamed to yourself and your fellow meditators. Venerable Atzari Aman was very talented in teaching the heart. When those of his disciples who were intent on studying with him would listen to anything he'd say, it would go straight to the heart. Straight to the heart. The things we should put into practice, we would put into practice. The things we should understand right then, dealing with internal matters, we would understand, every time, step after step. When we were ill, he would teach us how to contemplate. When you have a fever, where did you get it from? He'd say this so as to serve a purpose, as food for thought for meditators. From where did you drag out the fever and chills? They arise in this body, don't they? When they disappear, where do they go if not back to where they came from? Even if they don't disappear, they die together with each of us. There are no exceptions at all in this body. Investigate it so as to know it. All dukkha, all pains are noble truths. If we don't investigate them, what are we going to investigate? The Buddha gained awakening with the noble truths. His disciples gained awakening with the noble truths. So are we going to gain awakening with weakness? Would that be in keeping with the Tamma of the Buddha? Then we've come to resist the Tamma. Where does the pain arise? In which part? Ask so as to find out. When it hurts here and aches there, who is it that hurts? Who is it that aches? Probe on in to find what instigates it. Where does it come from? Where does it hurt? What causes it to hurt? What perceives it as pain? When the body dies and they cremate it, does it hurt? Who is it that deceives itself into thinking that this hurts or that aches? Investigate so as to find its initial causes. If you're a meditator who doesn't know initial causes and doesn't know their effects, this heap of suffering, then how are you going to cure suffering? What is your banya for? Why don't you think? Why don't you find it and put it to use? Your mindfulness and banya are for keeping things in mind and investigating them. Things such as feelings of pain that exist in your body and mind. He would keep stressing his points, step by step. If the person listening was intent on listening, and especially if he had any fighting spirit, he'd find it easy to grasp the point, and it would appeal to him immediately. Immediately. When we'd leave Venerable Atsari Aman to live in any spot suitable for the practice, his teachings would seem to reverberate through the heart. 
you could remember every facet of his teachings, every important point that should be used as a tool in the practice. For example, if you were staying in a challenging place, it was as if he were right there in the heart. The heart would be really audacious and exultant in practicing, knowing the tamma, seeing it, understanding it. You would understand with audacity and with a warrior spirit, not by being discouraged, irresolute, or beating a retreat. That's not the way to make the Gelesas fear you and disappear from the heart. That's not at all the way to cure Gelesas, to know the affairs of Gelesas, or to be able to remove them. This is the religion. There is nothing to compare with it in being so correct, so precise, so genuine, so true, so indisputable. If we all were to follow the principles of the religion, there would be no need for prisons or jails. What need would they serve? Nobody would be doing any wrong. People would see in line with reason and acknowledge their rightness and wrongness, their good and their evil, using the principles of reason as their standard. We human beings would then be able to live with one another. The reason we need laws, prisons, and jails is because we don't admit our wrongs. When we are wrong, we don't admit that we are wrong. Even the moment after we see ourselves do something wrong, we won't admit to it. Even when we're put in jail and are asked, we still say, They accused me of stealing this and stealing that, even though we ourselves actually stole it. This is simply an unwillingness to admit to things in line with reason, in line with the truth. Even within the heart, with things that concern us exclusively, the same holds true. We don't admit to them, which is why we receive so much pain and suffering. If we admit to the principles of the truth, the things that appear in line with the truth can be resolved through the truth. For example, even when pain arises in the body, it won't disrupt the jitta because our knowledge is wise to it. As the principles of the Tamma say, pains have been appearing in our body and mind ever since we first became aware of things. There is no reason for us to get excited, frightened, or upset by them to the point where they disease the jitta. This is why mental development or meditation is an excellent science for gaining knowledge on all fronts. Those who practice consistently are not upset when pain arises in the body. They can even focus on the point where the pain arises so as to investigate and analyze it in line with its truth until gaining skillful and courageous tactics for dealing with it admirably. The important point is to associate with sages, wise people, those who are sharp and astute. If we aren't yet able to depend on ourselves, we have to depend on our teachers to instruct us. If we listen often, their teachings gradually seep into us and blend with our temperament until our jitta becomes a jitta with tamma. Our jitta becomes a sage, a wise person, and can eventually take care of itself, becoming atahi atano nato, its own mainstay. So in every activity where we aren't yet capable, we first have to depend on others. In living with those who are good, we are bound to find peace and happiness. Our traits come to mesh with theirs, this is important, until our own traits become good and admirable as well. It's the same as if we were to associate with bad people. At first we aren't bad, but as we associate with them for a long time, our traits blend themselves with theirs until we become bad without being aware of it. When we are fully bad, this makes us even more blind. We feel that we've become even better, no one else can push us around. Otherwise, our goodness will jump into action. The goodness of a bad person. An evil that wise people everywhere fear. Bad people and good people. Evil and good. These things get turned around in this way. Bad people thus can't see the truth that they are bad, and so flatter themselves into thinking, I'm good, I'm smart, I'm clever, I'm one of the most renowned operators around. That's how they twist things. For this reason, associating with meditation masters, with sages, is important for anyone who is striving to become a good person, who is hoping to prosper and be happy, because sages will teach us often. Their manners and deportment that we see day after day will gradually seep into and nurture our jittas. We can hold to them continually as good examples, for everything they do, in every way, is all tamma. Especially if they're people devoid of kilesas, 
then there is nothing to compare with them. Like Venerable Atari Aman, I'm certain that he was devoid of Gilesas. After hearing the Tamma from him, I had no doubts. He himself never said that he was devoid of Gilesas, you know. He never said that he was an Arahant or anything. But he would say it in his ability to explain the true Tamma on every level, in a way that would go straight to the heart and erase all doubt for all those who came to study with him. This is why I can dare to say unabashedly that Venerable Atari Manpuri Dattatera is one of the important Arahants of our day and age. An age in which Arahants are exceedingly rare, because it's an age sadly lacking in people practicing the Tamma for the sake of Arahantship. Instead, we practice to eliminate Arahantship by amassing all kinds of miscellaneous gilesas. This holds for all of us, so no one is in a position to criticize anyone else. Let's return to the subject of feelings. To investigate feelings of pain is very important. This is something I learned from Venerable Acharya Man. He took this very seriously whenever any of the meditators in his monastery became ill. Sometimes he would go himself and ask, How are you contemplating your illness? Then he'd really emphasize the tamma. Go probing right there. Wherever there's pain, investigate so as to see the truth of the pain. He'd teach how to investigate. Don't retreat. To retreat is to enhance the pain. To be a warrior, you have to fight using banya. This is what will bring victory. The ability to keep up with the feeling of pain that you hold to be an important enemy. Actually, that feeling isn't anyone's enemy. It doesn't have any sense of consciousness at all. It's simply a truth. That's all. So investigate on in. You don't have to anticipate it or concern yourself with whether it's a big pain or a small pain. All that's asked is that you know its truth with your own banya so that the heart won't deceive you. That's what he would say. Actually, our heart is deceit incarnate. Because that which deceives is within the heart, and fools the heart into making assumptions and interpretations. Stupidity has an easy time believing lies. Clever people have an easy time deceiving stupid people. Deceit has an easy time fooling stupidity. The cleverness of the Gileases gets along well with our own stupidity. This is why the Tamma teaches us to ferret things out, to investigate down to their truth, and then to believe in line with that truth. This is our means of gaining victory step by step. Ferret out the pains that are always with you so as to see them. Don't run away from them. Whether they're big or small, investigate right there. Investigate right there. If you're going to concentrate, concentrate right there. When you are investigating its causes, no matter how great the pain, keep probing in. The thing we call pain, what does it depend on as its foundation? It depends on the body as its foundation. It depends on our attention as its means of flaring up. In other words, the attention that defines it in various ways. This is what makes pain flare up. We have to cure this kind of attention by investigating to know both the pain, what it's like, and the place where pain arises in whatever part of the body. Try to know clearly whether or not that spot is really pain. For example, if there's pain in the bone, in any part of the skin or flesh, the skin and the flesh are skin and flesh. The pain is a pain. Even though they dwell together, they are separate things, not one and the same. The jitta, the knower that is aware of these things, is a jitta, but it's a deluded jitta, so it assumes that this is pain, that's pain, and conflates these things into being itself, saying, I hurt here, I hurt there, I don't want myself to be pained, I want the pain to vanish. This desire is a kilesa that encourages pain and suffering to arise. The heart is pained. The feeling of pain in the body is pain. The pain in the heart flares up with that pain because it wants it to follow the heart's desires. These things keep feeding each other. This is our own stupidity, loading us down with suffering. To be intelligent, we have to investigate, to watch the feeling of pain in the heart. What does it come from? What does it depend on? It depends on the body. Which part of the body? From what spot in the body does the pain arise? Look at the body and the feeling. Are they one and the same thing? What kind of shape and features do they have? 
The feeling doesn't have any shape or features or a posture of any kind. It simply appears as a feeling of pain. That's all. As for the body, it has a shape, a color, and complexion, and it stays as it was before the pain arose. When the pain arises, it stays just as it was. Actually, the pain is something separate from this. It simply depends on a malfunction of the body to arise. The jitta is what takes notice of it. If the jitta has any banya, it should notice in line with its truth. The jitta then won't be affected by it. But if the jitta is deluded, it latches on to the pain. In other words, it pulls that pain in to be itself, and then wants that pain, which it says is itself, to disappear. This is why we can't analyze it. Once the pain is our self, how can we separate it out? If it's simply a pain, a separate reality, then the body is a separate reality. They aren't one and the same. Each one exists separately. Each is a separate reality in line with its nature. Only when our awareness is like this can we analyze things. But as long as we see the pain as our self, then we can analyze it all day long and not get anywhere. Because once we hold that this is myself, how can we analyze it? We haven't separated these things with banya, so we have to keep holding on to them as our self. When the kanthas and the jitta blend into one, we can't analyze them. But when we try to use mindfulness and banya to investigate in to see the truth of these things, that each exists separately, each has its separate reality, which holds true for us and for everyone else, and this realization goes deep into the heart, then the pain gradually fades away, fades away. At the same time, we know what makes the connection from the pain into the heart because the connection comes from the heart. When we investigate the pain, it comes retracting into the heart. All the affairs of pain come from the heart that experiences mental pain because of an insidious connection by way of attachment, upadana, that we don't yet know. When we investigate so as to see clearly, we follow the feeling of pain inward. We come in knowing, knowing. The pain keeps retracting and retracting into the heart. Once we know that the heart is what created the attachment, making itself construe the pain to be itself, creating a great deal of suffering, once we know this, the pain disappears. Or alternatively, once we know this, the pain stays real, but the heart doesn't latch onto it. Even though the pain may not disappear, the jitta is the jitta. It doesn't make any connection through attachment. Each is its own separate reality. This is called the jitta being its own self. Cool, calm, and collected, in the midst of the pain of the kanthas. This is to know that the jitta is a reality, just as each kantha is a separate reality. This is the path for those who are practicing so as to become wise to the five kanthas with feelings of pain as their primary focus. But for those who understand all the way to the point of reaching the unshakable citta, the unshakable tamma, aguppa citta, aguppa tamma, that can't be provoked into being anything else, there is no problem at all. Whether pain is little or great, they have absolutely no problem because their jittas are always true. There is never a time when their jittas, which are already pure, can become defiled, can become worlded. There's no way it could happen. For this reason, whatever conditions the kanthas may display, such people know them in line with the principles of nature. The kanthas themselves appear in line with the principles of nature and disappear in line with nature. They remain naturally and then disappear naturally. The jitta knows in line with its own nature, without having to be forced or coerced in any way. The jittas of those who know totally all around are like this. As for those of us who are investigating the kanthas to know them and withdraw from them step by step, even though our jittas are not yet like that while we are practicing, even though our hopes aren't yet fulfilled, still our investigation of pain is for the purpose of separating the jitta from the pain so that it's not entangled in pain, so that whenever pain arises in greater or lesser measure, the jitta doesn't cling to the pain as being itself. We do this so as not to gather up the pain as being ourself. 
which would be the same as taking fire to burn ourselves. When we can do this, we can be at our ease. So pain is an excellent whetstone for Banya. However much pain arises, set your mindfulness in Banya focused right there. Turn to look at the chitta and then expand your awareness to encompass the feeling and the body, each of which is already a separate part. The body is one part, the feeling is another, and the chitta another. Keep going back and forth among them, investigating with Banya until you understand, and it really goes to the heart, that each kanta is simply its own kanta and that's all. None of them appears to be any such thing as you or yours. They are simply different realities that appear, and that's all. When you understand clearly like this, the heart becomes its own free and independent self at that moment, and it knows that the jitta and the kantas are separate realities, neither affecting the other. Even at the moment when you are about to die, the heart will be up on events in the immediate present. It won't be shaken by pain and death, because it is sure that the jitta is the jitta, a stronghold of awareness. Each kanta is simply a condition. The jitta thus doesn't fear death, because it is sure of itself that it won't get destroyed anywhere. Even though it may not have yet reached the level where it's absolutely devoid of gilesas, the jitta has still prepared itself using banya with the kantas so that it's supreme. In other words, it lives with the noble truths. It lives with its whetstone for banya. Banya will spread its power far and wide. The heart will grow more and more radiant, more and more courageous, because banya is what cleanses it. Even if death comes at that moment, there's no problem. For one thing, if you use mindfulness and banya to investigate pain without retreating to the point where you understand it, then even when you really are about to die, you'll know that the pain will disappear first. The jitta won't disappear. It will revert into itself, knowing exclusively within itself, and then pass on at that moment. The phrase, mindfulness lapses, doesn't exist for a person who has practiced the Dhamma to this level. We can thus be sure that a person with mindfulness, even though he or she may not be devoid of gilesas, will still be clearly aware at the moment when pain arises in full force to the point where the kantas can no longer endure and will break apart, will die. The chitta will withdraw itself from all that and revert to its mindness to being its own independent self, and then pass on. This is a very high, very refined level of tamma. For this reason, meditators who are resolute and unflinching for the sake of knowing every level of the tamma tend to be earnest in investigating pain. When the time comes for them to know, the knowledge goes straight to the heart. They regard their pain as a noble truth, in line with the Buddha's teaching that all living beings are fellows in pain, birth, aging, illness, and death. So when investigating the kantas so as to know them in line with their truth, you shouldn't try to thwart or resist the truth. For example, if the body can't endure, let it go. You shouldn't cherish it. As for the pain, it will go on its own. This is called Sugato, faring well. This is the way of investigating the chitta and training the heart that gives clear results to those who meditate. They have meditated in the way I've described, so when the time of death is really upon them, they don't hope to depend on anyone at all, parents, brothers, sisters, relatives, friends, anyone. They have to withdraw the jitta from all things that entangle and involve it, so as to enter that crucial spot where they are engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. At a time such as this, at the moment when you are about to die, take pain as the focal point for investigation. Don't be willing to retreat, come what may. All that's asked is that you know and understand this point. Don't go thinking that if you die while being embroiled in investigating pain like this, while the jitta is in the midst of this commotion, you'll go to a bad rebirth. Why should you go to a bad rebirth? You're embroiled, but with a noble task. You're embroiled with knowledge, or for the sake of knowledge, and not because of delusion. 
The chitta is focused on investigating and probing pain. When the time comes for it really to go, this knowing chitta, the chitta with mindfulness knows, will withdraw instantly into itself. It will let go immediately of the work at hand and withdraw into itself, to be itself, the jitta and nothing but, and then pass on like a sugato with the full capability of a meditator, even though we may not yet be devoid of gilesas. This is called having full strength to our full capacity, in line with our level of jitta and tamma. Investigation and mental development are thus important matters, matters on which our life and death depend. We needn't hope to depend on anyone else at all. Of this we are certain within ourselves. The heart knows within itself how strong mindfulness and banya are, and needn't go asking anyone else. If the heart is able to investigate to the point where it can pass on at that moment, all doubts vanish. There are no problems at all. If you think that because you're a woman or because you're a layperson you can't realize Nibbana, that's your own misconception, which is one kind of gilesa deceiving you. The Tamma is a truth and everyone's common property. Whether we are men or women, lay or ordained, we can all have mindfulness and manya. We can all cure our gilesas. When we are willing, any man or woman, any monk or layperson can use any of the methods to cure kilesas and gain release. We needn't create problems to plague our hearts and waste our time. Since when do I have the potential to do that? Don't think that! You're developing the merit and potential right now! However much or little, you can see it right here in the heart. We should examine ourselves. Wherever we are stupid, we should develop intelligence, mindfulness, and panya. Only then will we be doing what is genuinely right in terms of the principles of the Lord Buddha's Tamma. If we criticize ourselves, thinking, that person is on this level or that level, while well, we don't have any level at all. Wherever we go, this person gets ahead of us, that person gets ahead of us. Actually, nobody is getting ahead of us except for the Gilesas that get ahead of us and deceive us into feeling inferior and depressed, into thinking that we have only a little potential. That's simply a misconception aimed at making us discouraged and self-pitying, because Gilesas are looking for a way to kill us without our realizing it. We shouldn't think in those ways. We are full of potential, all of us, and why shouldn't we be? We're meditators, we're all devoted to making merit. Potential isn't something we can set out on the market to compete with one another. Every person has potential within him or herself. We are taught not to belittle one another's potential. Even with animals, we're taught not to belittle them. Think of that, because potential lies in the heart of every person and every animal. So when curing gilesas, you needn't waste your time thinking those things. They'll simply ruin your morale and your resolve. To think, I'm a worthless woman, a worthless man, a worthless monk, a worthless layperson. I don't have any paths or fruitions at all. Other people have them, but I don't. I'm ashamed to show them my face. These are wrong thoughts that will spoil your resolve in developing the various forms of goodness. The right way to think is this. Right now, I'm making an effort, with mindfulness and banya, to cure kilesas and to develop what is good and meritorious step by step, which is the direct way to develop my perfections, bar me. I have the potential. I was born in the midst of the Buddha's teachings and have developed the potential and the perfections to my full capacity all along up to the present. Women can have mindfulness and banya just like men, because women and men both have gilesas, and gilesas are cured with mindfulness and banya, backed by persistent effort, both by men and by women. And where do they have gilesas? They both have gilesas in the heart. When mindfulness and banya are complete, women and men can both pass over and beyond, with no question of their having to be ordained. This is the truth of the noble truths, which are not particular about status, nationality, or any of the human races, and which are not particular about the male or the female sex. All that's asked is that we strive, because the tamma is common to us all. Women and men, lay and ordained, we can all listen to it, understand it, practice it, and cure the gilesas. The gilesas don't favor men or women, 
We all have gilesas. Even monks have gilesas. What do you say to that? Monks thus have to cure their own gilesas. If they don't, they lie buried in gilesas, just like people in general who aren't interested in the tamma, or even worse than people in general. The tamma thus doesn't stipulate that it's only for those who are ordained. What is stipulated is that we cure Gilesa with persistent effort. This is something very important. We have to be very interested in this point. As for release from Dukkha, where do we gain release? We gain it right here, right where there is suffering. If we can cure Gilesa, we gain release from suffering. If we can't, then no matter what our sex or status, we all have to suffer. Here. This is where the religion lies, here in the heart. It doesn't lie anywhere else. If we want to be incapable of it, we can be incapable right here in our heart. Whether lay or ordained, we can be incapable if we make ourselves incapable, or we can make the religion flourish in our heart. That we can also do. When the religion flourishes, where does it flourish? In the heart and nowhere else. The important point is the heart. The important point is our practice, the actions, the manners we display. When the heart develops, the various aspects of our behavior develop beautifully admirably. In particular, the heart flourishes within itself. It has mindfulness and banya looking after it constantly. This is called a flourishing heart. The kilesas can hardly ever come to damage it. That's when the religion flourishes. We should make an effort to examine and straighten things out step by step. The gilesas, you know, are no wider or greater than the limits of our ability to cure and remove them. They're only here in the heart, so investigate right here. Whether we're men or women, lay or ordained, we all have gilesas in our hearts. No matter how thick they may be, if we consider them, we can know them. They're like darkness. Even though darkness may have existed for aeons, all we have to do is turn on a light, and the darkness disappears completely. The darkness doesn't have any way to brag, saying, I've been dark for aeons, so there's no way that this puny light can chase my darkness away. When the causes are ready, the darkness has to disappear completely, and brightness appears in its place. Even though the darkness may have existed for aeons, it all vanishes in that instant. Even though the Kilesas may be thick and may have been lording it over our heart for a long time, we should investigate them thoroughly with mindfulness and banya. When mindfulness and banya are capable, they immediately become all around. The Kilesas, even though they may have been in the heart for aeons, will immediately disintegrate in the same way that the darkness that had existed vanishes as soon as a light is lit. Brightness arises instead, through the power of mindfulness and banya. Within the heart it is dazzlingly bright at that moment with Tammo Badipo, the light of the Tamma. This is all there is. This is the important point we have to investigate. Be sure to see it. The religion is marvelous. Where is it marvelous? The religion flourishes. Where does it flourish? The Buddha says to gain release from Dukkha. Where is it gained? It exists only here in the heart. To analyze it, there are the four noble truths. Dukkha, its origin, its cessation, and the path. 1. Dukkha. We know it's Dukkha because we aren't dead. 2. The origin of Dukkha, Samudaya. This is what fosters or produces Dukkha. What forms does it take? We're taught, craving imbued with passion and delight, relishing now here and now there. That is, craving for sensual pleasure, craving for becoming, craving for non-becoming. This we know. Whatever the Chitta may love or crave, we should try to straighten it out. It loves and craves the five kantas, and especially the five kantas that it says are me. So try to become wise to these things, step by step. And then there's more love and craving. Love and craving for the jitta, attachment to the jitta, cherishing the jitta. So straighten out the jitta. Wherever it feels love, that's where Kilesa is. Keep going in, straightening things out until you've reached the truth. Then the heart will have no love or hate, because they are all gone. The Gileasas are all gone. The Jitta has no love, no hate, no anger. It's a pure principle of nature within itself. This is the nature we truly want. 3. 
investigating for the sake of tamma. This is the path, magga, with mindfulness and panya its important factors. 4. The cessation of dukkha, nirotha. Dukkha stops step by step until the path is fully capable and nirotha stops all dukkha in the heart without leaving a trace. When Nirotha has finished stopping Dukkha, that which knows that Dukkha has stopped and Kilesa has stopped, that which knows is the Pure One. This Pure One lies beyond the Noble Truths as a marvelous, extraordinary Tamma. The Noble Truths are activities, conditions, conventions. Even Nirotha is a convention. It's the activity of stopping Dukkha. It's a conventional reality. When Dukkha is completely stopped, nothing remains. All that remains is an entirely pure awareness. This is not a noble truth. It's the purity of the Chitta. If you want, you can call it Nibbana. There's nothing against calling it whatever you want. When we reach this level, there are no conflicts. No conflicts, no disagreements with anyone at all. We don't conflict with ourselves. We don't conflict with anything. Our knowledge is wise to everything, so we can say what we like. There are no problems at all. All I ask is that you know this marvelous, extraordinary Tamma. Its excellence exists of its own accord, without our having to confer titles. This, then, is the genuine religion. Probe right here. Probe on in, when in the practice of the religion we come to know, will know right here. If the religion is to flourish, it will flourish right here. The Buddha, in teaching the beings of the world to gain release from suffering, taught right here. And release is gained right here, nowhere else. We qualify as beings of the world and lie within the net of the Buddha's teachings. We're in the Buddha's following. Each of us has the right to practice and remove gilesa so as to go beyond suffering and dukkha. All of us in the four groups of the Buddha's following, Parisa, have the right to realize ourselves and reach Nibbana. So, I ask that you contemplate, investigate, be brave in fighting the things that should be fought within the heart. Develop courage. Develop mindfulness and banya until they are sufficient. Search for various tactics for probing. These we should develop within ourselves. To probe on our own is the right way. It's our own wealth. Teachers lend us bits and pieces, which are merely fragments to serve as hints, or as leads for us to contemplate so that they'll grow and branch out into our own wealth. Any tamma that's a wealth coming from our own tactics, that's truly our own wealth. We'll never exhaust it. If we can think and probe cunningly in removing kilesas until they fall away completely, using the tactics we develop on our own from the ideas our teachers lend us as starting capital, that's our own tamma. However much may arise, it's all our own tamma. What we derive from the texts is the Buddha's, and we borrow it from him. What we get from our teachers, we borrow from them. Except when we are listening to them teach and we understand the tamma and cure gilesa at that moment. That's our wealth while we are listening. After that, we take their tactics to contemplate until they branch out through our own ingenuity. This is our own wealth in terms both of the causes, our contemplation, and of the outcome, the satisfactory results we gain step by step all the way to release from suffering and dukkha, and that's entirely ours. It stays with us, and no one can come to divide up any of our share at all. This is where the excellence becomes excellent. It doesn't become excellent anywhere else. So try to find the excellence, the peerlessness that lies within you by striving and being energetic. Other than this awareness, there's no excellence at all. But at present, the heart is concealed by things that are filthy and worthless, and so it too has become something that lacks its proper worth. Right now, we are washing it, peeling away the various kinds of kilesa, step by step, when we have used our full strength to peel them all away until there aren't any left in the heart, then the heart is fully pure. Excellence appears here in this heart, and so the excellence is excellent right here. 
We don't have to search anywhere for anything more, for we have fully reached the land of enough. So then, I'll ask to stop here.